In this video, we're going to take a look at how we apply the five-step hypothesis testing procedure that I outlined in a previous video. So first, we have to understand a couple things about hypothesis testing. Number one, the reason for conducting a hypothesis test, uh, that purpose is really to evaluate a claim about a population parameter. Um, so we're going to focus specifically on hypothesis testing on one population mean in this lesson. And for one population mean, there are some assum assumptions or otherwise known as conditions that we have to meet in order to use a specific hypothesis test on the mean. And we're going to focus on using the t-distribution uh, for these hypothesis tests that we're doing in our class, okay? So first of all, uh, we have to have a quantitative variable, a single quantitative variable. We have to have a, a population mean defined in context. We also have to know what the, the mu sub zero is, which we'll get to in a little while. Um, randomization has to be used to gather the data, and this is done for a couple reasons, but the big one is to reduce or eliminate as much bias in, uh, in selecting the individual uh, data points as possible. Uh, the third condition is the sample size is at least 30, and this is so we can apply the central limit theorem um, in order to conduct the hypothesis test. All right? The larger the sample size, the better, providing it's a random selection. And if we don't meet that, that third condition, there's another part of that, or is the population distribution approximately normal? So we often don't have the population uh, distribution, so what we do instead is we use the sample to um, see if that uh, looks approximately normal. So the sample approximates the population. We'll talk about that more a little bit later on. And then the last uh, uh, condition for using the t-test is that the population standard deviation is unknown. All right, so let's take a look at just some general information about the hypothesis statements, and then we'll look at the test statistic, okay? So we have uh, three types of tests that we'll be doing. We'll be doing a left tail test, a two tail test, and a right tail test. And with our null and our alternative hypothesis, first off, I want, want, to recall, want you to recall that H sub zero, our null hypothesis, is always a statement that contains equality. All right, so we have to have an equal to sign or a greater than or equal to sign or a less than or equal to sign. H sub A is always a statement that contains strict inequality. So like the less than sign, the not equal to sign, and the greater than sign. Now there's five ways that we can write a hypothesis statement. I'm going to focus primarily in the lessons that I do using the complement rule. There's, there's reasons why we might use these other ones right there, and it's really not going to change the test or what we do. It's just written slightly different for maybe a specific reason. All right, so when we do a left tail test, the thing that defines that this is a left tail test is H sub A. Think about the arrow. It's pointing to the left in both of these hypothesis statements, so that's why we're doing a left tail test. And our level of significance alpha, which we're, we're gonna talk about later on, that would go in the left tail, and our rejection region is also in that left tail, okay? With a right tail test, you can see that the arrow goes to the right in both of these hypothesis statements, so it's pointing to the right tail, and so that's why we do a right tail test, that's where our alpha value would go, and then our rejection region would be in that right tail. Now the not equal to sign doesn't have um, an arrow that points in either direction. So when you think about the not equal to sign, think about the not equal to sign, really uh, that implies that um, mu could be less than mu sub zero or mu could potentially be more than mu sub zero or greater than mu sub zero. So it's something different than, something other than uh, that specific value, all right? And we'll get, to, we'll get a chance to see some of these in action when we go through um, the lessons, okay? The next thing we have is our test statistic. Like I said, we're gonna focus on the t-distribution, which is over here. This is what we use when our population standard deviation is unknown. If we knew what the population standard deviation is, we could use the z-distribution over here, okay? But we're not gonna focus on that in this class. We're gonna focus on the t-distribution. I just wanted to point out the difference between the two test statistics, just in case you encounter those. All right, now let's take a look at an example. So I have this example here. Uh, maybe you know I'm teaching class one day and I, I make a statement like, uh, we believe that students in our classroom are taller than 68 inches on average. That'd be an example of a claim about a parameter, all right? I'm, I'm saying that I believe that uh, the, the population mean of students in my class is greater than 68 inches. Um, so to investigate this statement, we took a random sample of eight individuals and recorded their height in inches. And right here are, is the random sample of our eight individual students right there. Those heights are recorded in inches. 
And so I would do a little bit of number crunching and calculate uh, first off the sample size, which is eight, the mean, which is 71.13, the standard deviation, which is 4.883. And there's some other statistical measures on here that we could use as well, but uh, we're gonna focus on those ones right now. So before we even begin this, we should identify some of that given information. So we have um, those summary statistics that are, that are given from the data set. We have our level of significance over here. And this 68, that's gonna be our mu sub zero value, which you'll see in just a little bit. But before we can decide to do a specific hypothesis test, we have to go through and we have to check and make sure we meet the criteria in order to perform that test. So, um, when we move forward, I just want to point this out in example one, anything that is a solution or an answer to part of the step is going to be in blue, and then the actual steps or the components of it are going to be in black, okay? So uh, first off, step one, uh, the assumptions or the conditions. So we have to have one quantitative variable and a defined population mean as one of the conditions in order to do a hypothesis test using the t-distribution. So we should identify what the quantitative variable is and what the defined population mean is in terms of context. So uh, our quantitative variable is the height of an individual student in inches, and the population mean is the average height of all students in the classroom, okay? So I'm gonna be a stickler about the word all right there because that's telling me you know what the population really represents in the situation. It's all of the students. This is about all of the students. All right, so we meet that part of the criteria in order to perform the t-test. Now we need to move through the next uh, criteria, which randomization is used to gather the data. So we used a simple random sample to select these eight individuals. So we use some sort of randomization technique. And the reason we wanna verify this is we wanna make sure that we eliminate or reduce as much bias in the selection as possible. And if we do a simple random sample, that's gonna help eliminate or reduce some of that bias. The third assumption is this, is the sample size at least 30? In this case, the answer is no, the sample size is eight. So if we only had that part of the condition, we wouldn't be able to apply the central limit theorem and we wouldn't be, a, be able to apply this hypothesis test with this. So we have this other part of the condition that is this, or is the population distribution approximately normal? Well, in order to see this and determine if it's approximately normal, we have to look at some graphics and specifically, we're gonna look at the box plot in the histogram. And um, I, I do wanna mention with a word of caution that I probably wouldn't use a histogram in this situation because my sample size is only eight. But since I'm the one that created the problem and selected the, the, the data that we're using for this, I'm, go, I'm just gonna go ahead and show the histogram as though it's reasonable. Generally, I probably wouldn't use a histogram unless I had a sample size that's closer, close to 30 or larger than 30. All right, so the conditions for being approximately normal are um, the distribution has to be free of outliers, it has to be symmetric, and it has to be unimodal. And some of these characteristics we can see in specific graphics and others we cannot see in that graphic, okay? So the first one I would look at in this, this situation would be the box plot. And in actuality, I'd probably only look at the box plot in this case because I have a sample size of eight. But I'll, we'll look at both of them. Uh, so in this box plot, when you take a look at this, you can see, first of all, it looks kind of close to being symmetric right here. Maybe a little left skew. It looks a little longer on the left side than it does on the right, but it's really hard to tell. I would say that's probably approximately symmetric. And you can definitely see that there are not any outliers. Those would be indicated by an open circle or an asterisk or some other symbol outside the ends of the whiskers right there. So we'd say, judging uh, this based on the box plot alone, we'd say maybe it's approximately normal or pretty close to that. Now, if we look at the histogram of this data, you can see that the histogram takes on certain characteristics and we're looking for modality and also symmetry with the histogram. We can't really see outliers definitively with the histogram. Uh, but we can see the symmetry and we can see uh, the modality of it. So in this histogram, it is unimodal. It has one hump, it goes up and it comes down on the other side. And it has some slight left skewness. You can see that the tail goes off to the left direction right here. But again, it's not really that significant. So I'd say, well, the histogram appears to be approximately normal. So since we meet those criteria of being symmetric, free of outliers, and unimodal, we can say that the distribution appears to be approximately normal. And remember, we don't have the population distribution. We're using the sample to approximate that uh, population, all right? And part of the reason this works is because if we did a good job with our random selection, we're eliminating or reducing bias, and that sample should somewhat resemble what our population looks like, okay? Now, just a real quick note, 
if this didn't appear to be approximately normal, we would not be able to use the one sample t-test for the mean. We'd have to turn to a non-parametric test, which is taught in another class, okay? All right, so that's step one. We're saying we're good to go with using the t-distribution to do this hypothesis test. So now we have to write our null and our alternative hypothesis statement. So I wanna show you where these come from. Um, so we have to go back up to the problem and take a look at this. So up in the problem, if you look at this, we said we believe that students in our classroom are taller than 68 inches on average. So this taller than implies the greater than sign, okay? So that's something we have to be able to pick out out of the problem. And the 68 inches is our mu sub zero value right there. So if I go back down to the hypothesis statement, that's giving us our alternative hypothesis, H sub A. Mu is greater than 68 inches, or students, all students are taller than 68 inches on average is basically what that's saying right there. And then I'm applying the complement rule, so if they're not taller than 68 inches, then they have to be 68 inches or shorter in this situation, okay? Remember, H sub A always has to, has to have that statement of strict inequality, and H sub zero has equality in there. So this is telling me a couple things. One, my rejection region is going to be to the right of my picture for my t-distribution. And it's also telling me that my alpha value, my level of significance, is going to fall in that right tail right there. So this is my rejection region right here. This area right here is my fail to reject region. And basically what I'm going to do from this point moving forward is I'm going to see if my p-value is small enough to be over in this rejection region right here when I compare it to my alpha value, all right? And uh, just to make sure that we understand the difference between the two, we have our test statistic, which we're going to calculate. That would be a numerical value that follows this horizontal axis right here. The scale of the horizontal axis is in T. This alpha value, that's an area right there under the curve. And our P value is also going to be an area under the curve. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at how we calculate our, our level of significance, our test statistic, and our P value. So back up in the problem i said that i wanted to evaluate this uh, with an alpha equal 0.05 level of significance i might have not might not have identified the alpha part of it but i definitely identified the 0.05 level of significance the level of significance is our alpha value and that's 0 0.05 one other thing that i like to do on the level of significance side of this table is i like to calculate the degrees of freedom and the degrees of freedom are n minus one if you recall that's the equation for it and so in this case, we had a sample size of eight. We subtract one from that, and that gives us a value of seven. This, um, this T value that I have written right here, T at 0.05 and seven degrees of freedom, that would be the critical value if we're doing the critical value approach. We're not gonna focus on that in this class, but I, I did think, um, I, I did wanna present this so that way you could at least see it, just in case the, the textbook you're using is showing you um, how to use the t-value rather than the p-value approach, okay? So this t-value right here is based on that level of significance and the degrees of freedom only. It doesn't take into account um, any of the summary statistics that we got from the sample, okay? So over on the right side of this table, we're going to calculate the test statistic, all right? So the test statistic is x bar minus mu divided by s over the square root of n. So that's really the standard error right there. And the whole crux of this is we're trying to compare what we got from the sample to see if it's significantly different from what the hypothesized value of the population mean is. And that should be mu sub zero. I just noticed there's a mistake on that and I'll fix that in the handout. So, um, so the bigger the difference between these two values, x bar and mu, the more likely we are going to be to reject h sub zero. And if these two values are very similar, then we're less likely to reject the null hypothesis h sub zero, okay? So from here, it really becomes a plug and chug type of problem. We're gonna plug in our sample mean and our hypothesized value of the population mean in the numerator, our sample standard deviation and our sample size in the denominator. And then we're gonna go through and we're gonna calculate the, the um, test statistic. And I'd recommend doing the numerator first and then the denominator next and writing it as a ratio like we see right here and then doing the division last just to avoid mistakes because often what I see in terms of problems is students will type this in exactly like you see it on your calculator and we ended up taking 71.13 and subtracting 68 divided by this all right so we don't divide both uh, don't divide the difference by the standard error 
So when we do the math on this, our test statistic ends up being 1.813. That test statistic is gonna fall somewhere on this line right here, the horizontal axes in our picture up here. If that test statistic falls over here to the right of where T at alpha is in the degrees of freedom, then we're gonna reject H sub zero. If it falls over here to the left, then we're gonna fail to reject H sub zero. But we're gonna do that using the p-value approach. So to calculate the p-value, we're gonna use this function on our calculator called the TCDF function, all right? And the inputs for the TCDF function are the lower bound, the upper bound, and the degrees of freedom. This test statistic will be one of those two bounds, either the lower bound or the upper bound, and the degrees of freedom are given over here. So um, this is something that's pretty important, okay? So our test statistic is 1.813. You can see that that's going to be to the right of zero somewhere. We don't know whether it falls in this fail to reject region or this rejection region over here. We just know it's to the right of zero, okay? Now the other thing is, this alternative hypothesis is saying we want the area to the right of that test statistic, okay? So if my test statistic is, we'll just say it's right here at this T at alpha right here, I'd want the area to the right of that. So that means my test statistic is going to be the lower bound and my upper bound is going to be positive infinity. Since we don't have an infinity sign on our calculator, I'll use the value of one million, something fairly large. Um, in order to represent that. So when I do this TCDF function, my lower bound will be 1.813 because I want the area from that test statistic to the right. So that's gonna be my lower value. My upper bound is going to be one million and then my degrees of freedom are going to be seven. And when I plug that into the calculator, I get a p-value of 0 0.0564, okay? So I'm just gonna tell you this right now, that p-value is larger than our alpha value. So if you think about the area, the area for this p-value is going to be bigger than the area for that alpha value, which is gonna force the test statistic to be over here in the fail to reject region. So we're gonna end up failing to reject our null hypothesis as a result, okay? So uh, using the p-value approach, the decision rule is this. If our p-value is less than or equal to our alpha value, then we reject H sub zero. So that's the statement we will always use. That will never ever change when we use the p-value approach. So what we need to do is we need to compare the p-value to the alpha value and make a decision regarding h sub zero. So since our p-value of 0 0.0564 is not less than our alpha value of 0 0.05, we will fail to reject h sub zero. So that means there's not evidence to reject h sub zero. If you wanted to think about this as a true or false type of thing, it means that there's evidence to suggest that H sub zero is probably true. And if H sub zero is true, that means there's evidence that H sub A is potentially false, okay? We can never be 100% certain, but there's definitely evidence that supports H sub zero being true, okay? Now, if we were doing the critical value approach, we would be comparing our T value to our, um, our test statistic to our um, critical T value, all right? And we would say we reject H sub zero if our T value, our test statistic is greater than our critical T value, which is over here. And we can see that 1.813 is not larger than 1.895. Uh, so we had failed to reject H sub zero. Okay, again, we're not gonna focus on this in this class, but I thought I'd present it just in case your textbook shows you that information. All right, so now we know what we're gonna do in regards to H sub zero. We're gonna fail to reject it. There's not enough evidence to reject H sub zero. So in the conclusion statement, I like to use a generic statement, and so I'm gonna use the, um, use the statement that goes like this. There is blank sufficient evidence to support that, the blank on average in the population. Okay, so that's the generic statement. And what I do is I generally put H sub A right here just to be fairly consistent, okay? H sub A was our original claim um, in the problem statement, if you recall. We said we believe that students are taller than 68 inches, okay? So that was the claim and I wanna make a statement about that claim. So there is not sufficient evidence to support that the average uh, height of students in our classroom is more than 68 inches on average in the population. So that's really H sub A right there in words, what H sub A represents. And there's not evidence to support that because we said um, there's not evidence to reject H sub zero. In other words, there's evidence that H sub zero is potentially true and H sub A is potentially false, okay? All right, so hopefully that gives you an idea of how to handle um, a hypothesis test.
Um, and we'll take a look at some examples uh, a little bit later on as well.